This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Today's reading um, is in celebration of student poets and their um, fabulous awards. Here today to introduce um, the readers is Jeffrey G. O'Brien. He is the author of Green and Gray and the Guns and Flags Project. He's also co-author in collaboration with the poet Jeff Clark of 2A. His third collection, Metropole, is forthcoming from the University of California Press in 2011. And he is assistant professor in the English department here at UC Berkeley. He also teaches at San Quentin State Prison. Please welcome Jeffrey G. O'Brien. Thank you, Giovanni, and welcome to the last lunch poems of the semester and the year, and I think a pretty fitting culmination. Um, I'm actually filling in for the unfillable in for Bob Haas, who couldn't be here and is extremely disappointed that he can't be here, and so I'm conveying an affectionate apology to all of the readers from him as well. Um, before we begin, I think it would be remiss of us to not have a round of applause for Giovanni and all the volunteers who do the invisible labor. <laughs> All right, um, I can't, I have to allow myself one little comment before we begin, which is just that although I am also of the English department, like Bob, I'm really happy to see that we don't have a monopoly on poetry. As I look at the bios of the students who will be reading today, I see that there are so many experiential roots to poetry and so many disciplines that find a way to be adjacent to it. So I'm really happy to see that diversity represented. All right, we'll begin. So here, Abgal is a fourth-year pre-law English major with a minor in creative writing. She is the editor-in-chief of the Muslim student magazine Al Bayan and has read at open mics and slam poetry events around the Bay Area and at Cal. She is a single mother to a four-year-old boy. Welcome, so here. Thank you. This poem is entitled, A Woman. She was a woman of multiple faces, most of them stark. She arose every morning at precisely the hour of slighted darkness. Her life was intentionally barren, her mind desolate most of the time. Existence was much brighter in her chest, her heart was often white. She emptied the chicken's coop with a beautiful reluctancy. With every movement of her fingers, her eyes would squint, her nose twitch, and her mouth twist in disdain. This was a man's job. Her execution was flawless. She worked in the home so as to demand the most respect. She walked at an angle so as to demand the most attention. Her scaled palms disgusting. She was a ravishing open wound. Right soul cracked, almost peeling, chipped the outer edge of the journey half to pieces. The remnants lay flat on the floor. Hardwood was a better value, that was a given. Estimates from crooked men sounded like rubbish at noon in the summertime. For dinner was the rush, for dinner roasted duck. Half-washed hands extend far beyond the necessities of the stomach. Growling wolves scared the birds the most in the forest. The leaves sang because of the pain. Beauty wasn't in the vase. Her mother almost broke it at midnight. The, edge, the edges sharpen. Pine cones just barely brushed the smallest toe. Stubbed blood ran down the drain when the razor cut too close, the lack of attention. She was always late on Sundays, God visited. Rubber faces seemed to plaster the walls. The clerk said it would take a few weeks. Paint dries slower in the center. The wounds are deep, blood is real thick. Eyes glazed over semi-gloss semi look so much brighter in the light. Sermons are bold for households. Often, decisions make the man. You're only as crippled as your souls allow. Your ankles are in perfect proportion to the rest of your body. There's no reason you shouldn't marry sooner. Heavens just around the shrubbery, true lefts in a sharp right. The street's real narrow. Right soul crack, left soul slacked a little like capris in the winter time. It just doesn't work by force. We were just going to walk together and remain as close to the ground as we could. We'd fly if the sky weren't so dreary and if dreams had wings. 
Because to fall meant to fail, we never lost bounds. You leaned on me too hard, it hurt too much to be false. You gripped, your grip marked prison bars down my back. Because, fa because failing was living, I lost. Thank you. Next we have Julianne, Julianne Athen, a, a, st a student teacher poet for Poetry for the People. Her hands are always full with pens, her guitar, paint, or books. Good that there are alternatives. She has produced a self-written play with Playwrights Project in her hometown of San Diego and loves to dance and sing. Julianne Athen. Hello, this is my legend poem. It's based on Zeus. Um, who, it was prophesied that any of his children would overthrow him, so he swallowed his um, wife, Metis, when he found out she was pregnant. And this is also about myself, which is why it's titled, For Father, Who Didn't Know Mom Wasn't on the Pill Anymore. <laughs> you swallowed your wife in fear that your children would overthrow you, a god's fear, swallowing you whole with no chance of redemption, you swallowed your own problems until they grew budding seeds inside. Your head swelled with lightning pain until you screamed and took an ax to the growing problem. And like the prophecy, a child was born to you, but still you feared the wrong things. Zeus, when Athena sprung from your forehead, did you bleed? Did you feel the bliss and agony of birth? And when you saw her silver armor sealed with royal head of Gorgon, when you saw her gray eyes flash and her sure-footed landing, when you saw the grace of your blood coursing in her limbs when she yelled a warrior's cry, stamped her staff upon the ground and looked at you with eyes of fire, did your swollen head deflate? Did you fear a different kind of destruction? You didn't think you would love her? Thanks. Our next reader is Rose Booker, who is a senior English major and creative writing minor. I promise we'll get to the non-English majors at some point. Her honors thesis is on Lewis Carroll's poetry. She is also working on her second chapbook, a short story collection, a poetry blog, and several knitting projects. So she's busy, and here she is. Um, hi, um, this poem is actually dedicated to all the graduates and anyone who ever like, has decision-making problems. So, um, <laughs> um, standing at the crossroads, signpost blank. He looks left, then right, then down. At dusty converses, the color of dead rattlesnakes. He does not lift his head. Behind him, a cardboard road speckled with lost newspapers and rimmed with dying grass stretches towards the horizon. There is no water in sight. Overhead, a sheet of gray attempts to be white as the cold wind blows in from the west. Thank you. Joseph Bush has a really radically understated bio. Um, Joseph Bush is a long, long, long time Lunch Poems volunteer. That's because my bio is given in SNPs every year, so by now it's like, it's already <laughs> adequate. Uh, this poem is dedicated to my daughter, who uh, after eight years as an undergrad might actually uh, get a diploma next week up in Humboldt. <laughs> Still got my fingers crossed. Afraid of dark. How she touches me so sweetly with her fears. When I, closer than her to the end of my days, can sleep the night through, while she, so close yet to the source of whatever spark sprang from loin to lioness, must fret the darkness and come padding softly to bedside to beg for light. What have we to fear, dear daughter, to think that you, my prize, parted from darkness with tears and cries, must shy from it now, while I shall follow a frightsome path, which those returned from the brink can testify ends in a bright white glow. Thank you.
Next we have uh, Kathy Jetnell Kitchener, who was born in the Marshall Islands and raised in Hawaii. She has been a student teacher poet for Poetry for the People. She is in her last year pursuing a BA in creative writing. Kathy. I forgot to add that I'm getting my BA at Mills College, just to put that out there and, you know, put Mills on the map. Anyways, um, this is a poem uh, that's written, oh, never mind, I'll just read it, okay. At 15, I decide to do my history project on nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. Time to learn my history, I decide. I weave through book after article after website, all on how the U.S. wants to use my island home for nuclear testing. I sift through political jargon, tables of nuclear weapons with names like Operation Bravo, Crossroads, and Ivy. Quotes from generals like, 9,000 people are out there. Who cares? I'm not mad at all, really. I already knew all of this. I glance at a photograph of a boy, peeled skin, arms, legs suspended, a puppet next to a lab coat lost in his clipboard. I read firsthand accounts of what we call jelly babies. Tiny beings with no bones, skin, red tomatoes, the miscarriages gone, unspoken, the broken translations. I never told my husband. I thought it was my fault. I thought there must be something wrong inside me. I flip through snapshots of American Marines and nurses branded white with bloated grins, sucking beers and tossing beach balls along our shores. And my islander ancestors, cross-legged before a general, listening to his fairy tale about how it's for the good of mankind to hand over our islands, let them blast radioactive energy into our lazy-limbed coconut trees, our sagging breadfruit trees, our busy fishes that sparkle like new sun, into our coral reefs brilliant as an aurora borealis woven beneath a glassy sea. God will thank you, they told us. Yeah, as if God himself ordained those powdered flakes to drift onto our skin, our hair, our eyes to seep into our bones. We mistook radioactive fallout for snow. God will thank you, they told us, as if God's just been waiting for my people to vomit, vomit, vomit all of humanity's sins onto impeccable white shores gleaming like the cross burned into our open, scarred palms. At one point in my research, I stumbled along a photograph of goats tied to American ships, bored and munching on tubs of grass. At the bottom, a caption read, goats and pigs were left on naval ships as test subjects. Thousands of letters flew in from America protesting animal abuse. At 15, I want megatons of TNT, radioactive energy, and a fancy degree, anything and everything I could ever need to send ripples of death through people who put goats before human beings. So their skin can shrivel beneath the glare of hospital room lights three generations later as they watch their grandfather, the auntie, their cousin's life drip across that same black screen, knots of knuckles tied to steel beds, cold and absent of any breath, but I'm only 15. So I finished my project. Glue stick my ancestors' voice onto a poster board I bought from Office Max. Staple tables screaming the 23 millions of dollars stuffed into our mouths generation after generation after generation. <sighs> Chart my people's death by cancer on flowcharts in 3D. And at the top, I spray painted in bold, stenciled yellow for the good of mankind and entered it into a school district wide competition called History Day. My parents were quietly proud, and so was my teacher. And when the three balding white judges finally came around to my project, one of them looked at it and said, yeah, but it wasn't really for the good of mankind, though, was it? And it lost. So my eyes are imperfect, imperfectly alphabetical, and I skipped over Mary Fontana, um, who I assure you exists. Um, Mary Fontana loves writing and reading poems, but in her spare time, she is a graduate student in immunology here at Cal. Her work has been published most recently in Prairie Schooner. So out of order, Mary Fontana. I do exist. And uh, I've been told that I look almost exactly like my mother when she did when she was my age. So um, this poem is called Other Earring. You are not wooden, but you look it, coffee lapping against tamarind in the glossy and absolutely smooth hemisphere I used to rub with one small thumb. Or was that your sister? lying now in some doldrum below the sink where the scraps settle out, no longer gleaming like Friday night, 
not setting off the tint of my mother's tugged at hair, walnut and cinnamon smudging to gray where it twisted from the forehead, but slick with the remorse of dishwater, lacy with rust. You were twins once, but now you are something else I hesitate to name, one a young and uneroded version of the other. Tiger eye, I'm told, but surely that should mean green or striped or a stone that stares back. Worn, your singular weight unbalances. Unless I turn my cheek to the mirror, there, the shell-like elegant ear, my inheritance, and the floating moon of you, moon of teak, moon of upturned earth, whose gravity still grounds me. All right, next we have Kayla Krut, who's a freshman at Cal, intending to double major in English and comparative literature. She has recent, recently been published in CLAM, or C-L-A-M, and by Hanging Loose Press. She received the 2010 Joan Lee Yang Memorial Prize in Poetry. Kayla's favorite writers at the moment are Milan Kundera, Vladimir Nabokov, Anne Sexton, and Wallace Stevens. So Kayla. Hi. Um, this poem is called A Tibetan Gesture of Devotion. All last summer, there was only her to ring the bell. The city was southern and cloudless, a place where not once was she asked to validate her actions. At 19, he smoldered but did not ignite. Santa Anna nearly consecrated her body, speech, and mind until she rocked with the inertia of impermanence. Having none of these, body, speech, or mind, subsisting on Tantra itself made August easier. To writhe and to touch and to speak and to think, each surrendered its cosmic weight. Though she did not withdraw from participation, Recall the movie where as a creature yoked in a gold necklace, sanctified, she bore his long arm on her shoulder, reminiscent of something performed as ritual. Nothing of this is here, but we still should be grateful, is what she decided, as days washed past, swirled past, oversaturated with the colorful physical with his pressing presence, with her highly displaced devotion. He fished her swimsuit and towel from his trunk with more delicate caress than she ever could have done. Had his enlightenment preceded hers? No. He set them as sacred vestments, aromatic on the Acura's hood, told her what a good time he'd had, how nice she was to be with. She could see from the street that the light was not on in her house. Bodiless, bodiless, she had reminded herself, and his own moving carefully closer must not have been there either. It is only an object of worship, then, his mouth. She must merely study it, but closely. I will study it so closely I will make it mine, is what she decided any further, and he would have swallowed his only follower in that heated instant, because no, he could not keep his distance. She was the only one to ring the bell that marks the end of all attachments. As an appetite suppressant does, placidly, her meditation abated her seeping lust. She convinced herself out of him. He still shakes his brown head somewhere far off. Both of their stomachs are still churning, still empty, as though thrown from a great distance, as if dropped from a plane. Recall the moment in the sun, on a vast beach, his non-self prostrating before hers. Thank you, she had almost kindled the courage to say. Thank you, thank you, but I cannot cling to people anymore. Next, we have 
Ashley Listney, who is a graduating senior English major. She's an editor for the Cal Literature and Arts magazine and the winner of the 2010 Emily Chamberlain Cook Prize in Poetry. Ashley. Hello. Um, there seems to be a theme today of poems about parents, so this is another in that thread. Um, this poem I wrote several years ago for and about my father and have been obsessively revising a few times a year ever since. So this is um, the eighth draft of that poem that I still don't quite consider finished. Um, Daughter Pearl. Over an open-mouthed red wine and a wide round glass twinned in both our hands, he smokes a cigarette and smiles through a candle-dimmed vector, point A in his black eyes, can goldened B, brown in mine. We see as if in a mirror, a poor reflection taking each after our mothers, who are like salt, like the flavor of the earth. In the subject line of an empty email, he tells me this week, I put $50 in the joint so you can have groceries, love dad. And I see a sincerity, though still uncertain of what exactly he means. And I miss you, I miss you and my extra toothbrush in your bathroom. I don't have to say I'm sorry, his eyes say, for, no, for not knowing the child you. Of course I knew her. She had yellow hair. And who are you, you with dark eyelids? Eyes like pearls, you are my little girl. And I was a child, and I am a child, though nearing 23 years of distance since you first thought of me. And you who saw my unformed soul since before I was made, you knit me together, and I am fearful, and I am wonderful. The greatest of these is love. The greatest of these would be fleeing to the mountains where, like here in the canyon, two decades of knowing and not knowing leave only me and him here, knowing he remembers me now as he crushes the skulls of snakes beneath his feet, and I offer him a piece of tree. Next up is Jillian Osborne, who is a third-year graduate student in the English department. Her interests include American literature, transatlantic and transhistorical romanticism, landscape, confession, lyric, experience, balloons, and failure. So welcome, Jillian. Thanks. Um, I'm going to read this poem called Adirondack Camp. In the mountains, he tells me that in the late 90s, while in graduate school, he built a time machine. We are eating sandwiches and cornichons at a stickly table sitting on stickly chairs. The light fixtures are stunning, soldered, golden-colored glass. That's lovely, I say. He seems to have thought a lot about nostalgia, not only because it is something one does as one has more memories, but because the sentiment is more interesting than most. The time machine sat in a room surrounded by diagrams. Wind machines blew across and through its metal surfaces. The idea was you'd go inside and think of a time you'd like to go and then you'd be there. The idea was you'd be there inside the time machine. In the morning, we'd gone to the donut place down the road for donuts, hot from their vats, sugar providing a delectable shimmering of crust. Chomp, chomp, yum, yum. Food always tastes better in the mountains. The family had elegant old motorboats with wicker chairs chained up, bobbing in a boathouse with flags off the back. Used to take the train up from New York, glide across the water in a procession of summer white straw hats. The pines on the islands absorb the light faster than anything else as the sun excuses herself. I sit on one of the many chairs, Adirondack chairs, on the porch, pretending to read, watching a sail suddenly reflect the flagging light. It's too bad, I say to him, I can't be anywhere without feeling also a part, as if I were reading this in an outmoded old novel whose thoughts jettison about between psyches like jeweled billiards. You know the type, right? He's intelligent and kind. We stay up late, fitting together jigsaws, drinking heavily. Earlier, I'd sliced off the top of my thumb slicing tomatoes. The blood went everywhere, oxygen bright. I swooned, and someone put my head between my legs to soothe me. How do I always end up like this? I was asking myself, closing and opening my eyes. The carpet was patterned with forests and birds. The air rustled the world outside. We gathered together around the table to eat. 
Thank you. Northern California native Aaron Payton grew up in Sonoma wine country. Lucky you. Always a humorist, she enjoys combining aspects of natural space with concepts of human circumstance. This is Erin's last semester at Berkeley. Welcome, Erin. So sonnets are usually about love. This sonnet is about two things that I love very much, literature and cake. It's called Queer Sonnet Souffle. <laughs> It's okay to laugh, too. <laughs> what flavor is a literary cake? In dreaming, I imagine it quite tart. Perhaps it sweetens slowly as it bakes, perfecting tastes of culminated art. A wild cake is filled with berry mousse. The plath requires extra oven time. The Hemingway is loaded up with booze. The Dickinson needs just a dash of lime. While shortening flour, sugar with eggs do contribute to such culinary skills. What makes our cakes delicious is taboo. What makes us bad is really just free will. Deliciousness is found in breaking rules. Those who don't measure are not always fools. Thank you. Next, we have Anna Reeser, who was born and raised in the small Southern California town of Ojai. Lucky you. She is in her third year at Berkeley, working towards a double major in English and art practice. She is currently interested in intaglio printmaking and letterpress. Anna is also the editor in chief of the Cal Literary Arts Magazine. So, welcome, Anna. Hi. Um, so I'm going to read a poem today called Almonds, and I actually recently made um, some hand-printed broadsides of this poem, and so if you're interested in those, just find me after the reading. Okay, Almonds. I've been eating almonds one by one for the past eight minutes. I taste an oil between the halves. It gathers under my chin. Mom put salted cashews in the tin snack can last winter. Dad ate a handful with his beer while they made dinner. It is a ritual for them, including three different elements, a meat pressed into a disc, a squash, a bread. The way my boyfriend and I lie in bed in the morning is the way my mom and dad lie in bed in the morning. There is no railing on this bed and no curtain on the window. There is no ceiling. There are hands and mouths and there is a roof. When the leaves fall off these vines, the window makes this room an aquarium lit up for the whole city. It's okay, no one knows us here. I understand that I'm pretty. I wear jade plaid, dance so hard I fall on the beer-slicked floor. See, I repeat recipes out of ancestral memory, all subconscious. Brussels sprouts go well with pasta. They are in the oven. Thank you. Next up is Johanna Tansella, who is an undergraduate student at Berkeley, planning to major in math and minor in creative writing. Maybe you'll want to reverse that eventually. Um, he lived in Israel for most of his childhood. Welcome, Johanna Tan. I think I'm going to read two poems because they're short. Uh, the first one is Kafka's Transformations. One. In his dream, a man is lassoed and pulled through the roof. Two, the podat ball of yarn presents its pulsing entanglement. Three, the boy left his coat folded on a seat in the train. The train dutifully carries it away. Four, though you do not know it, the streets of the town are mapped in the lines of your hand. Five, the mirror introduces the face to its soulmate. 
Six, a white wall reflects all light and captures our sight. Seven, the piercing blade is cruel, but the wielding hand innocent. Eight, waking up from sleep, the soul adjusts to its container. And this one is called James Castle, and it's inspired by the exhibit that was in the Berkeley Art Museum. The world presents its materials in a sea of carton. The trampled upon will gladly bend. In a flat surface, there are still ridges and shadows bending happily like a word. Sound travels best through solids. There is always something happening where we do not see it. A ripple gently proceeds outwards. A bird's feathered wings were on the point of closing. There was a door with nothing behind it. There was a word that meant itself. The table arrived with building instructions. Thank you. So we've discovered that there are more people named Al than we had originally thought. And so we're gonna dial back to Amanda LaBerge, who was born in a small town in northeastern North Dakota. As a third year at Berkeley, she is studying comparative literature, creative writing, and education. Her current work finds itself pulled to and from the particularities of place and time, how inheritance, transference, and disjunction infuse our relations. Amanda. Thank you for coming, and I want to say thank you to the poets for your words, your stories, and your fight. Um, this is called Setting in the Sierra Madre. And I feet leaves slip, and I hips fields spread, and I bones stones heaped, and I hands day turned, days clamoring well, wells containing the day, a stone, its face constructed in sun. We drink devoid of well springs, but for our bodies, our drink, the tilting of dusk, dusk, a sooty skirt, a traversal. There is slack. The two are reconciled in saffron, in coral, later indigo. In between, you ease some in flux, in dusk, both a fracture and a passage, like the words that pepper our tongues. When we say celestial, we don't speak of gods. We speak of fixed glints, heat, handless blazes, all so friendly all so lonesome. For every sun, there are pairs of tongues, tongues inscribed, muted facsimile, here, uttering so many in the bellow we hear, still hear burning navels, amber as the phos phosphorescent incense of copal. Its smoke smooths between the cusp of day and night, each reciprocal, each full, each tongue, limb reads textures, rude scales, clouds like palpitations, animal tracks in the scattered cinder. A feral cat in ashen fur watches us, her litter in the brush. She appears and ceases, twofold mercurial in her slinky muscle like the dried river basin. It too passed all our bodies, its bending arch loosened over carved backs below, what looks like steps, benches for a ball game, piles of basalt glassy in warm throes of light. We lay this way on the hill of the organ cactus, thighs and backs, scratch dusk, drink as much eyes thrown wide, all in dilation, thousands of years of admonishing prostrates at our feet, feet upon the stone, arid stone, flaxen, 
palpable the hour in flush, hour of color bowing in slow circles round those winged shames playing within me, fleshy, breeding immodest, the jay in the woods you unfurl, nearly umbral, cast perfect shadow of opaque body as animals paw about, sound their cells, and the cinnabar falls, splitting the slouch of your forehead and I, I remember refraction, light bend. The sun has sunk by the time we see it, already swallowed by the turn. Time is lean, lean from turn, refraction, and I, hands, day turned, held dusk. And it is your torso that hounds me still, a hold, dusky hold. Thank you. All right, we're nearing the end. We have two more readers today. The first is Michael Schaefer, who is a sophomore majoring in English and who's reading at his first public event today. Never tell them that. He, he took Professor Shapta's introduction to verse seminar last semester and is working for the Berkeley Poetry Review. He loves romantic poetry, Catholic iconography, and action movies with real explosions. Michael Schaefer. Hi. Um, this poem is kind of a greeting, so it's good. It's called Welcoming Party. Come in, come in. Not much else I can say. They're already in the door anyway. It's just like me to have finally gotten an entryway just to have them walk all over me. The entryway, by the way, is painted white but with a green trim, which makes me think to tell them about the trim and how I think it looks like something English, country anyway. Charming is all they say. Well, that's all I expect. I guess it's not much more to anyone else. Or do they mean me? Am I charming? A question I guess no one can answer. But was it me or the entryway? Oh well, we're already into the living room, or they are. I follow behind, always minding my feet. They're waiting for me to catch up and explain the room to them. It's kind of crowded, I apologize. I'm so behind and moving, I'm not quite here yet, so to speak. So I'm still waiting to unpack everything until it all arrives. But come, sit down on some boxes. So I'm a host again, and they my guests among the unpacked things. Can I get you something to eat, to drink? How about champagne? May I propose a toast to my new home? Enthusiastic, they agree. It's something anyway. So I see if I can find some glasses, flutes. Now she talks. All I have unpacked is mugs, but there they are, the flutes in the fragile box. There are four glasses, flutes, and only three of us, so one of the flutes is filled and left aside, a joking sacrifice to Bacchus or Dionysus or whosoever might bless a new home in disarray. And he pipes in, so what's the toast? And I say, I think this one's to the house, or maybe it's guests. To the household ghosts? They, to the host. I shrug, they drink. The failed first toast is followed, of course, by others, to friends and health, and more often than most, to love. But the reminder of the first toast sends, and I don't know, a residue over the night, till when I've drunk enough to forget it, settled in, finally, just when I think the house fits, the night ends, and they leave the way they came. In the quiet afterwards, I remember our remainder, I look at the warm champagne, all that's left of the bottle. A moment of silent contemplation follows. I decide I've drunk enough to miss the flat taste. I drink and swallow. Thank you. So when I said that we had two readers left, I meant that we still have two readers left. <laughs> and in the continuing crusade against the alphabetical, we're gonna go back to J. Um, <laughs> Teresa Jimenez is an English major who studies American ethnic literature from 1950 to the present. Her poems have been published in the literary journals CLAM, Penumbra, and Milvia Street. Please welcome, out of order, Teresa. Hello, everyone. Um, this poem is about an unpleasant train ride. It's called Aboard. Aboard a train that drags its wheels up a worn out coast, a girl fights documents and anxiety from her seat. Decisions try her, 
as she squirms into the lint and soda stains of R25, pulls the armrest down while this train crawls northward up a haggard coast. Derelict meanders pop on and off the seats beside her, and through the window, leash-bound dogs bay behind chicken wire fences in township pit pitch stops bay to the foggy rooftops as this train staggers up a loamy coast. Now at the lounge table worrying with menthol wrappers and cold cut sandwiches, a bleached out face. She's near the vendor sweetening tepid coffee in styrofoam cups on this train which hiccups through the yellowed mountains just inland of the pallid coast. And back at her seat, she knuckles her temples and tugs at her cuticles with nerves tauter than the buckskin hides stretched across the windows of the quivering shacks which dot the railways on the train, on this train as it groans and staggers upwards along the noxious grayness of this aching, sighing coast. Thank you. Emma Tome is a third year undergraduate studying geography and environmental sciences where mistakes are not appreciated. <laughs> Emma. Um, thanks again to everybody for putting on this event and for all the other readers today. Uh, it's a real honor to read with you. Um, this poem is called Each Phenomenal Form. Understanding analogy as analogy itself. If origin breaks to an ocean, as a life is understood, as a book opens, as a book, as death being so being untranscendable, as it lends wholeness to kinship, to flesh, and so ascribes finitude to gracelessness. A vast similitude underlies all. He leaps unbounded to these desperate ends, choosing words carelessly, an aesthete that secretes one's own epitaph, as a lack, as proof that each phenomenal form rhymes with another. Thank you. All right, that concludes today's reading. So to thank them for their work and to thoroughly usher the summer in, let's have a final round of applause for it. <laughs>